everybody. Welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer. And with me, I have Kyle Ashworth. I'm going to kind of skip over what I normally talk about as far as the podcast and all that. If you want to donate, great. If you don't, I don't care right now. I'm just kind of too worked up to talk about much else than hi, Kyle. <laughs> Welcome. <are> <laughs> hi, Natasha. <laughs> nice to have you. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Yeah, something or other. I need something. Namaste coffee definitely from a different tradition at this point <laughs> so <laughs> from a different spiritual tradition okay so we just happened in the last few days at Brigham Young University in regards to three transgender students being very quickly dismissed from their clinical services in regards to speech therapy having to do with part of their services in regards to transitioning in their gender journey, which is, by the way, part of the normal standards of care that are basic, basic standards of care that are pretty much put out by WPATH as kind of national standards in our country for what anybody who is going through a transgender journey should be able to access as part of their clinical care. And and by the way, WPATH is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And they come out with their standards of care that they publish. You can find that at wpath.org. And they're about to come out with an updated version of that we're hearing any day now. So that's just to give a little bit of context. And there's lots of good reasons for that, but I'm not necessarily sure I want to focus a lot on that. What I'm really interested in focusing on is the confidentiality issue here. Like how did BYU know that these students we're receiving what I would hope would be confidential treatment, regardless, you know, like when you go to, for example, BYU counseling, you know, counseling center, and you talk about whether or not you look at porn or whether or not you're transgender, or whether or not you're having premarital sex or whether or not you're gay, those are all things that should be held confidential and whether or not they meet or don't meet the standards of the university and meet or don't meet the standards of the honor code. There shouldn't be any counselor, uh, (laughs) you know, like breaking that, you know, confidentiality clause with a counseling student, right, that goes to the counseling department. This is at least from a mental health standpoint. I would imagine that's the case too of any medical, you know, treatment, which would include speech therapy. I'm really interested in how the administration knew that these particular students were receiving, you know, gender affirming speech therapy. And I'm also very interested in understanding who is getting training at this clinic, because I'm assuming if it's a BYU clinic, there are graduate school clinicians who are offering these services, right? Like I did, like when I was going through my marriage and family therapy program, I was offering marriage and family therapy as a student therapist, right? Under the supervision of licensed therapists who were training me. And we were doing that through a university. My university was Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. So how is the clinician offering these services and how is that all kind of wound up into this? So I'm going to be quiet now for a minute and let you talk (laughs) and tell me a little bit about what you know, and then I will opine further. Yeah. So I think it might be smart for us just to back up and give a little bit more context on how we got to where we're at today. And this really started 18 months ago for the listeners who are unfamiliar with the story or just still grabbing just headlines. This started 18 months ago when the speech and language department of the communications disorder department at BYU with the clinic began treating three transgender individuals at the clinic for speech therapy. Now, interestingly, These three students who are BYU students that we should know, these aren't just community or public members coming in for free clinical services. These are three transgender students who, according to my sources, were referred to the clinic through the counseling department at BYU. So these three students met with counselors at BYU. The counselors at BYU referred them to the speech and therapy clinic. And I want to talk a little bit about the handbook as well, because I think that plays a a key role that the LDS Church's handbook 
uh, in transgender treatments and therapies that are allowed. But 18 months ago, these students entered into the speech and therapy program. They've been receiving speech therapy. And, and you kind of touched on what that therapy uh, would look like. It helps them affirm, match their, their voice dialects with the gender that they're presenting. From that 18 month treatment, things were fine. These uh, three students were vetted by the clinician in the, the clinic, by the clinical director and administration, from what I understand at the McKay School, which is the medical arm of the uh, comment department, the dean of that department. So there were multiple people who were aware of these students at a lower, I would say, grassroots level at BYU, as close to the ground uh, and the clinic as possible. Recently, from what sources are telling me at BYU, and this is, we all know Mormonism, when you start exposing the leaks and giving too much information away, there's a retaliatory experience that happens. And so I want to be super cautious, but according to sources at BYU, a student was the one who was upset, a student clinician was upset that three uh, transgender students at BYU were being treated in the clinic and reported that to BYU administration. Went higher than the clinical director, went higher than the dean of the McKay School, and, and went directly to either the honor code office or directly to the office of academics and made that complaint at that point. Now, I have to say that's what our very best speculation is because we know BYU and we know BYU isn't going to release a, a copy of the complaint, but that seems to be the general consensus among people within the know that that's how this leaked out. And, and once administration found out about it, and I, we should add this too, once administration found out they immediately, this was a month ago, this was on January 10th, that administration, we believe that the complaint was filed on the, the 7th or 8th of January. On the 10th of January, the clinical director of the speech and therapy clinic was notified to immediately, the words were terminate. I, I wanted it because I, I thought that was key to immediately terminate the clinical services to all transgender members, which at this point, there were three. The clinical director and those a handful of clinicians, the, especially the clinicians that were working directly with these clients, immediately rebutted and asked why. And the handbook was given as the reason why a church administration felt, BYU administration felt that these students and transgender people were exempt and no longer qualified for this type of service. Unbelievable, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it's, it's and, and just to be clear, because we're using the term students on two contexts here. So there's, there's the students who are receiving the services. There's the clinical students who are the therapists themselves who are studying to be speech therapists. And that's the student therapist that you believe that is, a, that is assumed there's a student therapist who was uncomfortable providing services that went against their own religious beliefs or their own religious ideas of what should or shouldn't be happening at BYU. And that clinical student, that therapist student is the person who more than likely went and made this complaint and report and went above their whole department in regards to what was happening. And this is something that comes up, you know, a lot. This is something that within the intersection of clinical health and religion, what's, what's a person to do, right? What is a religious person who doesn't believe in blood transfusions to do if they want to become a medical doctor? What's a person, a religious person who doesn't believe in abortion to do if, if there's an abortion that needs to be performed regardless of reason, you know, from elective to life-threatening situations for a maternal person? What's a religious person to do if I don't believe that gay marriage is sanctioned by God, but here's a gay couple, you know, who wants to work on their marital relationship, you know, in my therapy office. I mean, these are things that I myself had to look at my own religious biases from day one of my graduate degree studies, you know, back in, when did I start? 1990. Seven, day one, you know, we had to start addressing some of these issues. And each body of clinical studies, clinical, you know, from the medical oath to mental health issues to the code of ethics from the American Speech Language Hearing Association, which I have in front of me, says something along the lines of, 
and I'll read it here. The individuals shall not discriminate in the delivery of professional services or in the conduct of research and scholarly activities on the basis of race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, religion, national origin, disability, culture, language, or dialects. So quite frankly, my position is, is if you have an issue with offering services, professional services due to your own personal beliefs, and you're going to get butt hurt about it, don't enter the field. Do not enter the field. Go bake cakes. And I forget how that went down, whether or not you're supposed to bake cakes for all people or not, but don't enter healing. If you're not willing to heal all people, regardless of your religious beliefs. So this is, this is a uh, really interesting because in this country, our fetish with religious freedom, meaning really we get to discriminate against others. You know, the whole idea around religious freedom, I think is that people are thinking, oh, I won't be persecuted for my religious beliefs, but no, we really use it in a way to persecute others for their lack of religious beliefs or having beliefs that are different than ours interferes a lot with things as important as clinical training. So this is a, the, here's an accredited an accredited university receiving federal funds, taxpayer money, training clinical students to go out there in the world where they're going to be expected to treat all kinds of disorders, all kinds of people, all kinds of issues. And because of a religious disagreement, now these students, the clinical students will not receive the training that they need to know how to offer best care to transgender clients. And I think we should put ourselves in the shoes of an employer who's looking at a graduate who comes to their office as a, as a potential clinician and says, I have a degree from BYU. And what does that look like to a, an employer who sees and hears what's happening in the news with BYU's discrimination, history of discrimination, especially towards LGBTQ people, does that put the student, or now at this point, the new graduate clinician at a disadvantage in the workplace? Does that put the transgender LGBTQ population at a disadvantage to, because that graduate student will likely be hired somewhere as a clinician, and what type of services are, or quality of service is being offered to the population from a student at BYU who has been shown 80% of the clientele were taught a limited or reduced scope of, of clinical therapies. I think that's problematic for a student. I think that's prob problematic for BYU and even more problematic for a potential employer who may not be fully aware of BYU's practices. Yeah. And it's so interesting too, because, you know, I know that I've been around ethical boards long enough that, you know, we, when we talk about these things, it's very simple to just say, well, thank goodness, thank goodness that they terminated the BYU students because the BYU students are probably not being best served, you know, by these clinicians who have these biases, right? So good, they'll go somewhere else and find better services. Or if you are gay or transgender, don't you want to know if your clinician has a bias against you? You wouldn't want to go to that kind of person anyway, right? So, so good, let's, let's have these people who are biased say that they're biased, have the right to say that they're biased and have the right to discriminate so that we don't put, you know, vulnerable populations in front of biased clinicians. But at some level that puts the onus on the vulnerable population. That puts the onus on the transgender clients who should be able to walk into any freaking clinic and be able to have trust that a trained clinician knows how to put their own biases aside and offer best standards of care practice. That should, should be basic. Transgender, non-binary, gay, lesbian, queer, bisexual person should not have to go into a space wondering, is this a safe space? A space that is clinically you know, mandated by, by authorities that we have in this country to regulate according to ethics, best practice standards that are like, just common sense, common sense. And oaths, and oaths of, of doing no harm. And oaths of doing no harm. All in protection of the, the privileged, usually white, usually cis, usually heteronormative, usually patriarchal, usually religious majority that does not have to do the work 
to move beyond these discriminatory internalized, you know, homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, whatever it is that they're they're coming from culturally. Most graduate programs that I've seen deal with this issue very differently. They dismiss the student. <laughs> the student comes with a complaint. I cannot see this type of person, or I cannot, you know, I'm going to spout my beliefs, you know, in very inappropriate ways, or I'm going to say, well, no, I cannot work with you because you're a lesbian couple. So the graduate program dismisses the student at that point. And there have been several cases in this country where the student has tried to appeal that or sue the graduate programs due to that, like they have the right, they have the right to discriminate in this way. I have never seen a student, I don't believe, win that outside of these religious institutions. I have seen one student in their university settle, but not necessarily outwardly win. That's how most universities are dealing with, you know, ridiculousness. Well, I think um, all cards on the table, we should know, and we should come to accept the fact that BYU is comfortable in its discrimination, that it has fought very, very hard to discriminate against certain populations. And I, and I think that is the message that we take from situations like this. I, I do agree that the transgender patients need quality care and they need care from clinicians who are happy to give that care and knowledgeable to give to and trained to give that type of care. We should know that these are the feathers that BYU is willing and, and anxious to strut around with. I also want to point out in all of my opportunities to speak about this topic in the inner circle with these sources at BYU who leaked this out, the overwhelming majority, and I want to say majority, majority of these clinicians in the speech and hearing department in the COMD department at BYU are LGBTQ affirming. They didn't want this to happen. They are absolutely on board with quality care with the LGBTQ community. Multiple people outside of the BYU organization who work, other clinicians who work with Lee Robinson and her program at BYU have everything great to say about the clinicians and the quality of care that has happened at the BYU clinic. But this is a grand example of what happens when one person becomes offended and takes that up to people who are not it, and I'll say this boldly, who are not administrators who are not qualified to be clinicians, making decisions on behalf of clinicians and, and the, the health and well-being of people who are in need of care. And that's what happened in this case. They took this complaint to the very highest reaches, which is likely Kevin Worthen, the president of BYU, and Shane Reese, the assistant over academics at BYU. And then that was just filtered down. And there was no discussion. Um, it was you can argue, you can make your case, but the, the decision has been made at the top of the chain. And that's our problem. And I think that's what needs to be called out. And I don't think that's a bold statement, Kyle. I mean, absolutely, these people are making decisions that are not clinical. They do not have the, qual the qualifications to be making these decisions. They don't have any understanding of the ramifications for mental health, for relational health, for spiritual health for the risk that this offers a student in a very vulnerable position. We already know that transgender individuals are at the highest risk of suicidality of any other member of society. And to face this kind of discrimination at your own university where you're already feeling silenced, already feeling more than likely like you're tiptoeing around a minefield of your own kind of educational experience and how you're relating with your peers and you're with your professors and what you feel like you're capable of sharing or not sharing more than likely in a very inauthentic space for yourself. And, and please don't anybody start commenting about, well, why do these students go to this place? It's so discriminatory. I'm like, because these are burgeoning young adults who most of them either don't have a choice necessarily of where they go to college due to a lot of family and monetary pressure, two, are oftentimes coming into their own identities during this time that is college, because that's when many people are doing a lot of normative developmental work around their gender identity, especially when you're coming from a conservative high demand religion who has put a huge suppressive and oppressive lid on that, during the time frames when maybe it'd be more normative to go through those developmental phases, like preteen, adolescent times when you're not allowed to consider those aspects of yourself. And then on top of it, putting the pressure that if you're going to even 
consider yourself in this way. Your entire academic transcript, classes you're in are now at risk due to something that's happening very personally in your own life. So I have a very zero tolerance for that argument. Please don't put it on my thread without. But I just wanted to add too, as I, as I speak with LGBTQ people in, in various situations uh, in this space, I always say there's more than one way to be gay or there's more than one way to do gay. And in this particular instance, there's more than one way to be Mormon also. Those who say, well, you knew what you were getting into when you go to BYU, you knew what the church, look, this is their church too. This is their Mormonism. This is their BYU. And this is their own personal revelation and their own personal experience, which in many aspects can be found beautifully wrapped up within the family proclamation about their own personal experience as well. That's but I, right. I just think it's disingenuous and gaslighting to say you knew what you were getting into full stop as if there is only one way to Mormon. And that's just not the case. Right. And even, and even if you do take the more traditional approaches, like I went to BYU, I had premarital sex. I went and confessed. I knew I had broken the honor code. I went with my whole, like just stupid, innocent, naive, you know, 18, 19 year old self, whatever age I was thinking they would work with me. And I wanted to be good with the Lord. And I was going to continue my studies. And I, I knew I was going to go through some type of repentance process. I never imagined I'd get kicked out in the middle of a semester, lose all my tuition monies, have to basically tell my parents what had happened because now all of a sudden my parents are like, wait a minute, why are you not attending classes? Like it was a shit show that I had, even though I signed the honor code, I knew I had done something wrong, you know, and I went and tried to correct it and, and go through the process that I thought would be corrective spiritually. It had a huge academic and familial response that I did not understand. And that was not like in legal, like there was no, I did not know what I was getting into. There was no, like, if you go confess, you will be kicked out mid semester and lose all your tuition monies. I never signed anything that actually said that. No, it just, it just makes me like livid. And then not to mention too, one other thing that people need to consider, although I have a, a love hate relationship as most of my transgender clients do uh, around the word passing. But this idea that if you pass means that you conform to the culture's ideas of what it means to be a man or a woman, right? In these very binary kind of ways that we consider gender. And the reality is, unfortunately, that the more you pass, especially if you're a trans woman, the less chance you have to be a victim of a violent crime. And that includes your voice. So offering uh, voice therapy to especially trans females would decrease their uh, chance to not have a, a crime committed against their safety. And believe me, especially after some of the actions that we saw from BYU students after Holland's wonderful musket talk, you know, bigoted students are very capable, Mormon bigoted worthy students are very capable of violence against trans students when given enough vitriol, like I'm doing something in the name of God. So there's, there's something here also that puts our trans clients at risk or trans students at risk when we don't offer services that they're wanting for a lot of times for reasons of personal safety. Yeah, so the, and I think this is a great segue into the handbook because the reasons why BYU administrators felt like the speech and language therapy had to be discontinued for transgender students was because it violated the handbook. And section 38.6.23 of the handbook is where they cited. And I think the language is so interesting because what you're talking about, what you just spoke of, Natasha, is about easing dysphoria and creating a more solid and stable uh, experience for the transgender person. The church's handbook says, some children, youth and adults are prescribed hormone therapy by a licensed medical professional to ease gender dysphoria and to reduce suicidal thoughts. They may receive church callings, temple recommends and temple ordinances. Here's the mind boggling thing. They will allow HRT, hormone replacement therapy, as a method to ease gender dysphoria and suicidal ideation, but speech and voice therapies are not allowed because it violates that very same principle. That is what the administration at BYU has hung their hat on. 
this policy, the procedures, the therapies to change or help these transgender clients feel more comfortable with their voice and language and speech are not permanent. They're similar to dress, to hair, to pronouns. Those are all things that aren't surgical. They aren't body changing, but the church feels, the administrators feel that it falls in line with transition. And I, I think this, this goes back to our discussion about how we have administrators who are not clinicians. They're so far removed from the, the experiences of the LGBTQ community that they see this only as an issue of transition, not as an issue of easing gender dysphoria and suicidal ideation. Mm. It's, it's so frustrating, so frustrating, so much double speak, so much misunderstanding. So uh, again, untrained. And, and even, even as, you know, even as we're talking about these like loopholes, like, well, it's not, you know, it's not something surgical. It's not something, you know, longstanding. I want people to understand the best standards of care for transgender people oftentimes does include reaffirming surgery, hormonal treatment, and long, you know, long lasting permanent changes. That's how you treat transgender health. (laughs) And that's how you treat it well. And that's how most people live good, vibrant, healthy, long term lives, right. And when we like, oh, well, we're doing this, but not this, because the church says this, the church needs to get out of mental health treatment out of sexual health treatment because it doesn't know what it's talking about and it needs to let science and professionals who have done decades of research and understand these things at a very very both personal and professional level take over right I mean the best thing that I think maybe Oak said a decade ago or however it was is that we don't know enough about transgender people that's where they should have kept it they should have kept it there that was a good place to start. We don't know enough. And then they should have gone to the professionals. So I don't know why they went from, we don't know enough to now we think we know things that they don't know anything about and they're overstepping and they're causing a lot of harm. And it just, it, yeah, it riles me up. This is why I say bad words. This is why I get excommunicated. This is why I get in trouble, but there's some really righteous indignation here because people suffer, people die and people are in crisis due to these kinds of very inept ways of dealing with people's very personal health. So surgery, voice and communication therapy, reproductive health, hormone health, mental health. These are all of the things, including post-operative care, lifelong preventative and primary care. These are all of the things that WPATH talks about in these best standards of care for long-term transgender health. And by health, we talk about biopsychosocial aspects of a person's life includes their whole life and for your religious community to not be a part of that is incredibly damaging betraying and and causes a distress that is just incredibly difficult to overcome many people it puts do you and i and you and i and your team asymmetry in triage mode all the time and the time. and we need we, we need to avoid triage mode it's time to enter into sustainability and thrive mode and the ability to rise and the ability to live according to the measure of your creation mode. I'm tired of, of suiting up my LGBTQ friend with armor so they can avoid the arrows and the bludgeoning that happens as they leave their safe places. It's just tiring and it's exhausting. And it also miseducates the public, right? Because when BYU does this, it miseducates the, the Mormon public. Great. And it, it, it continues these ways that people have misinformation about transgender health. It, 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 it continues to give them the inability to educate themselves correctly. And then, of course, they'll treat their friends and their family members, oftentimes, many times inappropriately, say things inappropriately. We have to remember that the majority of people that we interact with who are LGBTQ+, especially in a Mormon context, are still closeted. So you may be saying things within your family or friend circles that are very, very harmful without knowing that there's a transgender or non-binary or LGBTQ plus IA person in your midst, including your 10-year-old child, right? And this is, this is something that I don't think people understand fully enough. You earlier said this is a Mormon thing. You know, you, you mentioned BYU. I'm like, when I think about 
the federal government dropping its case against BYU for the dating thing that we just found out about as well today. This religious freedom thing is not a Mormon thing. It's not a BYU thing. BYU just benefits from it. This is an American issue, right? We have fetishized religious freedom in an American way that is causing harm across the nation. I just received in my email today a call to action from ASEC, the association I belong to, the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, because in Ohio, there is currently some bills going forward trying to stop basic hormone therapies for minors, even with parental consent, because again, the, you know usually the Republicans know what's best. Uneducated, untrained medical Republican politicians know what's better for transgender youth than medical professionals who specialize in transgender health. So there's a big call to action. If you happen to live in Ohio, I have put that link on my Facebook page. I'll share that link with you as well, Kyle, so that you can share it with your audience. We have to address, this is a bigger than a Mormon problem. This is an American fetishized problem of religious persecution. I think everybody got the idea that we can we can believe what we want to in this country. <laughs> I think I don't see anybody being persecuted for being able to believe a whole bunch of crazy ass shit, quite frankly. Crazy ass shit is all over the place. Everybody can believe whatever the heck they want. And I think we have a lot of weird ideas about what persecution means. Okay. But when you are taking away people's medical rights, that is persecution. And when you do that in the name of religion, and on top of it, public funds are supporting that. That's where I think we really need to make, we really need to make a difference. Now, if BYU wants to be a disaccredited organization that's not supported by the United States educational system, if it wants to be, you know, a weird, you know, space where people go and kind of do their own things and believe their own things, and it's not supported by taxpayer scholarships and funds and all those things, yeah, they have the right to do that. And accrediting boards like ASHA. If, exactly. if they want to forego all, the, all of those accreditations so that someone else doesn't have to hitch their wagon to BYU's ideology, I'm all on board with that as well. I, I say, go go forth and BYU do all the things that BYU wants. a doodle and as harmful as it wants to be in this country. They absolutely have the right to do that. But they cannot infringe national as, medical associations to, to allow for that. And that's what we're allowing in the, in the current way that we understand religious freedom in this country. So it's a, it's a bigger issue. It's not a Mormon issue. It's a, it's how we see legislation. Yeah. And I, and I think that is, I think that's well done. Well said. I think that is the delineating factor in this whole discussion is that you can be a conservative Orthodox Latter-day Saint who says we have the right to do this under our religious tenets. And I say, you absolutely do. Just don't bring my tax dollars and the accreditation of global accreditors who believe you're teaching something different hitch to your wagon as well. Unhitch yeah. us and, and do what you want to do. And don't think that you qualify for a, a, a state license in your field. And don't think that you are going to be on a referral list of, of our associations because you are untrustworthy now according to standards of care of, of medical standards. A basic medical standards. Which I think this is a great call to action to those who are listening to this. BYU is up for reaccreditation and um, ASHA, which is the accrediting board for this particular department, would love to hear your input. And you can contact them at asha.org and let them know your feelings about the BYU transgender issue and the, the way the the patients are being treated at the clinic. And ASHA may listen to those responses and take into account that this is this could potentially be problematic for their association with BYU. I saw your interview yesterday with some of the providers at the clinic. So I, I totally agree with you that I'm sure the providers, as if I was a provider at one of these clinics, are you know decimated or are very concerned about this. I am also sure that there are people at the BYU Counseling Center who are livid and very upset about this. Again, however, though, the power is not in the hands of the clinician. Isn't that interesting? The power is not in the hands of the clinician. The power currently is in the hands of politician and administration for health care, for health care. So we need to think about that, right? And at some point, I guess we also have to consider those of us who work 
whether it's LDS Family Services, whether it's BYU, whether, you know, it's, it's, it's always that challenge. It's, it's the same challenge I had as a member when, you know, they still allowed me to be a member of the church. It's like, you know, at what point am I in here in this system trying to make change? And at what point am I also like kind of enabling the system, you know, and, and that's a very, very difficult space to be in when you're trying to elicit change for the people who are within a system where you know that especially minors are being harmed and you're trying to be of help from within, from within. Yeah, a the most building, right? yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. So those are ethics in of themselves. And I think clinicians are, are constantly struggling with, especially ethical clinicians within conservative religious spaces where they're having to deal with these conflicts of interest. Well, Kyle, I know I talk too much. This was me just, blah, but what, what am I not asking you? No, I think, I think that gives the listener a really great overview as to what's happening, but also what we should expect to come from BYU. Sometimes, I mean, I look at this and say, as Latter-day Saints, we were so indoctrinated into this belief that do what is right, let the consequences follow. And is this the right thing to do? And I think every Latter-day Saint should ask that question with or without a transgender child. Is this the right thing to do? And what are the consequences? And I think those are personal questions you can ask yourself and then reflect on the actions that we've seen over the last three days at BYU and, and what consequences should follow. I remember one of the questions that I got asked in my kind of in the, in the letter that I got right before my disciplinary letter that was one of the complaints against me was, are you, are you saying that the church is a toxic place for LGBTQ plus members? Like how, how could you say that the church is not a good place for anybody? And, and, and this is, this is exactly why, this is exactly why I would say a mental health clinician would say, that's correct. The LDS church is currently not a safe place. It is a toxic place for LGBTQ plus members. And, and what's interesting about that, because you just said, you know, even if you don't have a gay child or a transgender child, do I want to send my kids to places where they learn bigotry, where they learn discrimination against others, where they potentially could be this clinician who thought it was, it was their ethics to go complain against a clinic who was offering a reaff you know, affirming services to a transgender person? Do I want to raise that kind of a child? So see, it's not even really healthy for the cis white privilege people. <laughs> it's not, right now, the LDS church, which I love and I have a lot of attachment to, and I, the reason I get so riled up is because I'm invested in its health, is not healthy. It is not healthy. It is toxic. It is toxic to the people it hurts and it is toxic to the people it teaches to hurt others. And I think this is systemic. We saw this at uh, Holland's speech in uh, August of 2021 at BYU, where he spoke with the uh, Seminary Institute teachers. And he said, we have a problem in the church. It's with our Gen X and our millennial Gen X, Gen Z populations. When it comes to LGBTQ topics, the line between condoning and advocacy has been blurred. And he said they've become friends with the LGBTQ community. And I think that is the systemic issue here, where here are active Latter-day Saints, Orthodox, conservative Latter-day Saints who look at BYU and think that they, that would be a refuge, a place to send their children who can be taught that there is a, there, not a fine line, there is a demarcation between condoning and advocacy. And I, that's not healthy either, because these students are smarter than that. They are, they are seeing that these LGBTQ people deserving and worthy of respect and admiration and the ability to change society for the better uh, in arts and entertainment and, and politics and, and all aspects of our community. And that scares the pants off of church leadership because they cannot control that. Yeah, yeah. If, if, the, if the Mormon church wants to be a place where you teach privileged people to discriminate against minorities, then it is a toxic place for everyone. And, and I think we even see that with the attention that we're getting, you know, Brad Wilcox is getting with his messages to the youth just this week as well. Like if, if that's the brand of Mormonism that we want to stick with, if, if that's, you know, because Mormonism has a lot of potential for a lot of different brands. <laughs> the, the brand we're currently going with, yeah, it's toxic. It's toxic and it comes from a lot of toxicity. There, there is, I think, resilience and health that's potentially there in Mormonism that could save, but it, unless that gets chosen out of the mess, 
it, it is a toxic place, whether you're LGBTQ plus I or not. And again, at the end of the day, the church is 100% within its rights to teach that version of Mormonism. Do what is right, let the consequences follow. And the hemorrhaging of membership is the consequence of that type of ideology. And people aren't staying. The reason why a Brad Wilcox is dancing all over Zion, pounding his pulpit, calling people stupid and ill-informed is that they are losing members and they can't control that either. And so you're, as Mormonism as a church, you're more than welcome to teach that, that rhetoric. You can be a Westboro Baptist church in Kansas if you'd like to be. But at the end of the day, your parishioners will leave as they have. And it, it isn't just this topic, but it's, I mean, we see a monumental November 2015 uh, policy changes. We see race issues, all of polygamy issues, all of these key indicators, church history that allow people to see Mormonism for Mormonism, and then they leave. And if they choose to leave, they leave. And and um, they just they can't control that if the narrative is sour. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I it's yep. <laughs> Exactly. So that's not something I should be, you know, excommunicated for, for calling out like health concerns within my community. And yet that's, that's the, that's just one example of how, you know, like this, instead of choosing health and ch instead of choosing humility, instead of choosing education, instead of choosing widening of lens, it's, it's choosing the opposite, right? Get rid of the critical voices. Let's stick to our guns. Let's, you know, throw out the people who are in the margins and let's just kind of stick in our bubble where we're comfortable. It's, it's kind of classic group think. It's kind of classic. It's, it's been repeated in history throughout a lot of groups. It's not anything new. It's, it's unfortunate that we're not a little bit more creative than that. The Mormon people come, I think, with a lot of spunk and a lot of history that is both problematic, but also pretty amazing. I, I would have thought we could do better than this, but it's, it's unfortunate. Kyle, as always, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Your work is amazing. <laughs> I, I'm, I, you, you seem like this tireless, like just ongoing, because <laughs> like, this is my job, right? But this isn't your job. What do you do for a living, Kyle? Are you, are you comfortable saying that on, on yeah, air? I, I'm a real estate developer. So. You're a real estate developer, right? At least like here I am, like just doing kind of my job, but you're like, how you have a job, but then there's this tireless stuff that I see coming from latter gay stories that it's just, it's just a treasure. It's treasure. So if know. I don't, who will? And I just, just going back to that comment about triage, I just can't see people in pain and suffering, but I, I also see the impacts of us being visible and being vocal and visible and advocating for the very basic needs of the LGBTQ community has paid off. And I knew, I knew the LGBTQ community myself as part of that community was worth the investment. I, I knew this was going to be uh, uh, something that I had to do for the long haul, but zero regrets. And I, I see the people who thrive. I see the people who stand on their own two feet. I see the people who succeed. I mean, it's that starfish principle. It mattered to this one and it mattered to this one. And I just keep looking ahead and seeing that the beach is full of people who, who need help and we need to do it. You've been instrumental in that process as well. We need more starfish throwers. We have lots of ocean. That's right. I agree. And sometimes um, that can be like, to, you know, if people get discouraged, like there's so many starfish, what's the point? Every starfish is a life every starfish matters and it is possible. It is possible with enough of us, with enough of us. It's not a challenge to get the starfish back. So thank you, Kyle, for all you do. Please visit Latter Gay Stories. Please, please, if you're considering donating to me this month, donate to Latter Gay Stories instead and find ways that you can contribute to your, your local community, your local community in regards to your pride centers. What are the trans resources in your community? What do they need as far as volunteer efforts? It just takes a phone call to ask. A lot of times it's, it's mainly monetary, but there's also a lot of times things that they need in regards to maybe bodies on the ground as far as, you know, getting a, a parade set up or getting booths set up or things like that. And legislative action, legislative action, writing your legislators. Every letter I remember because I was part of my lobbying kind of, you know, efforts as an MFT board member. 
And they said something like every letter, they, they, I think they think of it as like a hundred, a hundred to maybe it's either a hundred or a thousand voices. Like every letter represents that to a representative. Every letter matters. So write your representatives, run for office. And in this case, write ASHA specifically ASHA. In, in defense of the transgender students who are exiled from BYU. Uh, ASHA.org, let them know how you feel about this topic. And even though the federal government dropped their complaint or the investigation about uh, BYU students being able to date romantically at, on campus, imagine that, imagine that. <laughs> anyway, um, that's just step one. Keep complaining, keep complaining because the more complaints, the more they won't be able to ignore them anymore. Amen, amen with that. All right, Kyle, have a great day and weekend. Um, Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day. You're wearing your latter gay stories. I'm wearing my heart. I'm wearing my rainbows and I'm wearing my, my heart earrings for all those who are in this pickle. <laughs> so we love you. Mwah. We love you too. And your audience as well. Um, and your whole office. I, I just, I love them all. They have been so supportive to this community. Thank you, Kyle. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>
are extraordinary It's nothing ordinary love Ordinary, ordinary. No, it's extraordinary 